Okay, I'm gonna retry that. So, welcome everyone. Uh, I forgot to turn on my audio, apparently. So, thankfully, my co-host, Kent Trammell, is also with me and Hello. alerted me to the fact that I am just talking into nothing. Um, but basically, <laughs> welcome. And today, we're gonna to be looking at uh, Retopaflow 2.0, which is basically the new version of our retopology add-on that we've been working on for a couple of months now and is basically a complete rewrite okay, from the ground that. up. So, um, everyone. And so uh, what we're going to do, give me just a moment to make sure that I so mute the page behind me so that we don't get an echo. There we go. Um, so yeah, what I want to do today is I'm going to show you basically what we've been working on. I'm going to kind of introduce you to Rotopaflow if you've never seen it before. Um, I know we've got a decent number of people here who I recognize that um, I know you have it. You've been working on the old version, and so I'm going to show you everything that's new. I'm going to show you what it is and kind of what we're trying to do, and we'll go from there. So Kent Trammell is with me as a co-host, so feel free to ask questions in the chat, and he will relay those to me. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and go live. So first of all, one thing that you'll see is what you see on the screen right now is a mock-up of basically where we want Rotova Flow to be when we're done. Because basically what we're doing, our goal with it, is that Retopaflow is basically retopology tools designed for the artist. And specifically, what we're trying to do is to make retopology as easy and as artist-driven as sculpting is. Uh, in the same way that good sculpting tools basically completely transformed people's modeling workflow from a box modeling or polygon modeling workflow to be a more creative process, we want to do the same thing. Because there's very few people, myself being one of the rare exceptions, that actually like retopology. Most people <laughs> find it to be incredibly daunting, it's tedious, uh, it's technical, and just not a lot of fun. I mean, I think I saw a tweet from somebody earlier today even that was simply like, that retopology is my least favorite part of the character modeling process. Personally, I think they're nuts, I think it's the best part, it's way fun, you just get to work with geometry, and it's awesome. But, that being said, we want to make that process a lot easier. So let me go ahead and bring Blender up here. Uh, give me just a moment to fix my window, which apparently is not pulling up correctly. One second. And here we go. Oops, wrong one. And all right. So you should see Blender now, which has a skull model in it. And this is a really nice example of a hard surface model that was sculpted uh, by an artist named Ivan Santik, who may even be here in the stream. If, Ivan, if you're there, say hi. Um, and Ivan's work is available at mother, M-O-T-H-3-R.com, I believe. And he's doing just this beautiful hard surface rendering and modeling work uh, in ZBrush and Blender. And he was kind enough to donate this model as an example. So. Normally, if we were retopologizing something like this, it would be a very manual process via edit mode of just small extrusions and using the shrink wrap modifier and things like that. And so what we wanted to do is make this simpler. So first of all, Retopaflow has a set of tools known as contours, poly strips, poly pin, relax, etc. And each one of these are basically tools designed for accom accomplishing a certain workflow. So let's say that I want to start in poly strips. Number one, one thing you'll see, and this is in version 2.0, is, oops, I actually messed up, one second. There we go. Okay, as soon as it starts, one thing you'll notice is that we are completely re-overriding Blender's viewport in that we are creating a custom retopology mode known as Retopaflow mode, and we now have a custom UI with draggable widgets, which now has the ability to switch between our individual tools. And so let's say that I want to retopologize this area of the mesh. It'd be really nice if I could basically just draw on here as if I were sculpting. Well, thankfully we can. So using say the poly strips tool, I can simply click and drag, draw it on here, and I get a set of faces. Now what you'll notice is that these faces are then fit to a Bezier curve, which I can then manipulate at any point I can adjust the handles just like you might adjust curves in Illustrator or even the regular curves in Blender. I can then adjust those segments at any time. Um, there are a few bugs that you'll see as, as we're demoing this. Um, one 
thing in particular that has always been a little challenging is working with thin surfaces, but I'll elaborate that on that later. So what's cool here is I now have the ability to adjust this really, really easily. If I want to extend it, I can just draw from the side. It'll automatically connect. I can then bring this back. I can draw up. I can draw across like this. And you can just start basically mapping out your geometry really, really quickly. So this is the Polystrips tool. And the Polystrips tool is basically the, the main one that you would use for mapping out your geometry. Because one of the things that is really crucial to retopology typically is we are basically mapping out our geometry for whether it's animation, hard surfaces, you name it. Like in the case of this model, we have this beautiful sculpt um, by Ivan, but if we wanted to go in and get some really, really clean chamfers along these edges or things like that, we would want to retopologize this model in order to have really clean and crisp ed edges. And doing that using the traditional tools would be really, really slow. But here, I can go in and just tweak this just a little bit, get it just perfectly aligned to that edge. And the thing that you'll notice is everything snaps to the surface automatically. You know, one of the things that we wanted to do with this tool is just ensure that everything is inherently snapped. You shouldn't have to worry about surface snapping when you're working on geometry like this. It should just work. Um, and if you're familiar with version uh, 1.x of Retobo Flow, you'll may, you may have noticed a few differences here in that I no longer have junctions, um, I just have straight geometry. At any one point in time, I can go in and I can redefine a strip simply by selecting it. I can select this one, I can move that over. Even though I created this, say, with two different strips, I can just grab this one section just by right click and dragging over it. I can modify my curve, I can undo that. Um, you've really got complete control. And so one of the things that we ran into a lot with, um, with the original version of Retopo Flow was you spent a lot of time trying to map out, say, the geometry with, with poly strips, but then suddenly you'd say, well, I've got my, my mapping done, I'm now ready to start filling in areas, say, with a polypen tool. So you would have to hit enter, you would bounce out of Retopo Flow, and then you'd reactivate the other tool. Well, now you can switch between them at any point in time. So, for example, if I switch over to the polypen tool, I can jump right in here, I can grab this vert, move this one, I can say select this edge, and then by holding down control, I can see a preview of what I'm going to be creating. And the polypen tool is basically designed to allow us to create apps, um, geometry quickly, but with absolute control such that it places it exactly where we want it for when we need that utmost control. So in this case, you know, if I wanted to remove that area, I can just do that. I can select this edge, hold down control, click on that vert, click on that vert, creates it into a quad, and it gives us the ability to fill in geometry really, really quickly. Because basically the idea is, you know, most, most geometry that we create with Retopo Flow is going to be automatically generated either through, say, poly strips or contours where you're, you're drawing down a stroke and then it just basically fills the geometry based on either your brush size, the length of the stroke, whatever it may be. But there's times where you just need utmost control. You know, say like if I'm working on this little area right here, um, there's no good way to automatically fill that. You know, maybe I would say put in a poly strip, uh, say, along like that. But as soon as I get into these corners, I need to use the poly pen to then give me the absolute control to, say, do something like this, and then this, and this, oops. And we did get a little bit of a twist right there. Um, that's all right. You can definitely expect bugs at the moment. Uh, we are definitely still in the alpha version of PolyPen, or uh, sorry, of Retopo Flow in general, but it's getting really, really close. Um, if you've ever used version 1.x at all, then you would be shocked at just how much more stable this already is. Um, let me go in here a little bit, tweak this. And you'll notice I messed up some of my geometry there, so I might just delete that vertex. Select this, fill that, and then select these and fill that, and then we could continue on. Um, let's see. 
one of the things that we are also trying to do is basically make sure that at any point in time in the process, you should have the ability to modify the geometry as you need. So you'll notice that each tool, as I work through here, say poly pen, poly strips, etc., they all have their own functionality in what they're able to do where and how, but for the most part, they share a lot of functionality. So for example, you know, selection is of course consistent across all of them. Um, grabbing, scaling, and things like that are mostly consistent across all of them. But then they all also all have some, some unique functionality. So for example, poly strips, of course, is, is brush based. So I draw on my strip and it generates the strip based on the Bezier curve. Um, poly pen is gonna be just click and insert. But then we have a couple of tools, things like relax and tweak that are also brush based, but share some settings. So for example, relax, which is easily one of my favorite tools, allows us to just brush on um, a relax function. Now, you're not gonna see a lot of change here because what relax does is it attempts to basically make all faces square. And so as I draw in here, you can start to see some of that geometry tweak a little bit, but it's already pretty square. So let me give you a more extreme example. Let's say I go up here, go in, let me grab some geometry, and then just do some, some funky things with it to make sure that it's nice and broken basically and now we go in and relax and i might need to increase my strength a little bit well and welcome to the demo effect um, i will have to check why that is not working at the moment does it respect geometry boundaries like oh you know what it's only boundary uh yeah oh, there you go. That, good call so, yeah so um there we go so Jonathan Denning, who is the developer and who is also here in the stream, um, probably actually corrected me here, um, just added in the functionality here where you can lock or enable the ability to move boundaries or keep the boundaries um, uh, in place so that you have a lot more control to make sure that you only uh, destroy or modify the geometry that you want to. And since a boundary is basically any open edge, so in this case, all strips have open edges since everything but these inside edges are considered a boundary. Um, and so that's why it wasn't actually moving anything. And so actually, if we go back down here and whatnot, you can actually see it tweaking a little bit more. Again, it's still subtle because here it's, you know, we've still got mostly square geometry. Um, I'll show you an example here in a moment where it's a lot more applicable. But what's really, um, what's cool here particularly if you've used 1.x, is this whole time, I've never left Retopo Flow mode. I'm just working on my retopology. I'm able to switch tools at any time. But you'll notice that even though I had, I had a couple of errors, I never lost my work. And if you use 1.x at all, you'll know that one of the biggest issues was that you tended to lose your work. Um, I think our single most requested feature was a recovery because, well, invariably, we're doing a lot of heavy lifting under the surface, we're generating a lot of geometry, we're doing a lot of things that Blender does not do natively. You know, everything from drawing the custom uh, UI to overlaying the backdrop with a nice gradient to put the focus on what you're retopologizing, to doing the surface snapping, to the mesh drawing, all of these things have to be computed on the fly. And so, invariably, we would run into issues. And so, when things would crash, you would lose your work. Now, it's almost a complete non-issue. Um, not just because the code is much more stable, which it is. I mean, it's, it's night and day difference between uh, one and two, but specifically because everything that we're doing, say for example, I draw a strip here. That's, in, that's real geometry instantly, um, which initially we never did because we wanted to be able to keep everything really dynamic. You know, we wanted to be able to do things like adjusting the strip count, which you can see I'm doing right now. Uh, we wanted to be able to adjust the Bezier handles and to be able to modify the curve after the fact, even if we had deselected it, added new geometry to it, and then gone back and reselected it. Well, in the past, we weren't ever able to do that. Now we can. Um, I, I, I don't understand how we do it. That's all John working <laughs> his magic. Um, but what's cool is now if I hit escape, which in the past, you know, would cancel the operator, you would lose your work. Well, hitting escape simply just leaves the modal and the geometry is real. If I go back into poly strips, you'll notice that everything stays the same, stays the same. 
And so at no point in time, unless you get a hard blender crash, will you actually lose your work. Um, you will ha we do also have an additional feature though, which is if you look down here in the info panel, you'll see we've got a save count timer countdown. And right now we are auto saving, I believe it's every 120 seconds, but we can adjust this to whatever and we'll potentially expose this to the user as well, such that if you ever, let's say blender crashes, you lose power and you don't have a battery backup, um, whatever reason, blender crashes or your computer dies. Well, you can simply recover the autosave and it will restore back to where you were because then we're saving the Blender file behind the scenes in kind of, I believe it's actually in a custom format. It's not native because of uh, what we need to do with Retopaflow. That would be a question for John. But the point is all of the recovery issues are basically a thing of the past. Um, so let me pull up another example file here because I want to show you something that is really, really cool, and maybe one of my favorite things in Retopa Flow. So right now, I have this little torso, and I want to retopologize it. Well, in the past, you know, what we would do is we would activate, say, poly strips, and we would maybe work on the torso here a little bit, um, kind of lay out some of our geometry, how we like it. We would do all of this normal stuff. Um, but then the, the symmetry became a bit of an issue because we never really had great symmetry support. Well, now you can simply, under the options panel here, you simply click X and it enables the X symmetry. It draws the line to illustrate where the symmetry line is at, which is really, really helpful because the symmetry line, basically we're just adding a mirror modifier underneath the, the surface. And so if you discover that your symmetry line is, you know, at an angle and it's off to the side or things like that, it just means that your object origin was wrong. Because what we do, if we actually disable the, the only render, whenever we start Retopoflow, uh, Retopo we actually generate a new object at the 3D cursor location. And then that of course becomes the symmetry point within the mirror modifier. And so if suddenly your, you know, your mirror is off to the side or whatever, then that becomes a lot more, e more a lot easier to troubleshoot. Um, but the best part about the added symmetry now is we have contour support. So contours, along with all the other tools, has been rewritten from the ground up. And so what we have is, you know, the same functionality, it's same, you know, not a whole lot has changed in the, the core aspects of contours, although we do have the ability to change the count now live while we're in the modal now, which is pretty slick but we have symmetry support. So in the past doing the, you know, the, the trunk of the torso was always pretty tedious because in most cases, unless you're doing a really, really detailed model, this is just gonna be, you know, basically a, a cylinder. It's gonna be super simple geometry um, for the vast majority of cases, particularly if you're doing a game model or if you're doing something that is, you know, doesn't have a lot of um, surface detail, you may not have as much geometry requirements like you would in the pectorials and whatnot, particularly since, you know, the way that people move when bending, you know, whether you're moving to the side, you're bending over, you're bending back, all of that works with just a simple trunk geometry. And so contours was the perfect use case for this, except that it would always do stuff like this. It would cut all the way across and you had to manually go in and cut it. Well, not anymore, because now it detects the symmetry line and we can just do this. Someone was asking about that in the chat earlier. I just knew you'd get to it, but that's awesome. Yeah, uh, this is probably my single favorite feature that we've <laughs> added because it's kind of been like the the core wish list for a long time. Um, and John, I don't know how you did it because <laughs> he already revealed he's working using Black Magic. So yeah, yeah, pretty much. He's very transparent. Um, and you'll notice like even with symmetry, like we can still, we can, we can rotate the loops, we can shift the loops. Um, we don't yet, um, unless I'm just not aware of it yet, we don't yet have the ability to, to shift the loops around in that, like, if I wanted to say, take these vertices and kind of move them over to the right a little bit, mm -hmm. we don't have that yet. Um, it is on the wish list. Um, but this is then where like, you know, there's no way that we could have done this torso that quickly with any other tool. 
Um, hmm, yeah. Even adding in a cylinder and shrink wrapping that simply would not have worked. Uh, I mean, well, right. it would have worked great, but it'd be quite tedious. Um, yes. And so here in just a couple of minutes, or well, in less than a minute, honestly, um, I'm ready to basically start tying in the more complicated parts. And that's kind mm. of one of the things that we've wanted to do with 2.0. Um, and Kent, I think I'd talk to you a little bit about this is, you know, so much of optimizing workflow is, is automating the, the repetitive stuff and let the, let the artist focus on the things that really matter, which like in the case of a torso, the things that really matter is your shoulder joint. Like that matters more mm -hmm. than anything else in the torso. Uh, yep. ass assuming that you're doing this for animation, uh, which mm -hmm. is typically why you would retopologize an organic model to begin with. Uh, and so by automating the simple stuff, like make this really, really easy so that then you can put all your time and energy into the parts that matter. Um, but this then is where things like relax get really cool because now I can just use the relax brush, smooth this out. And since we have the, the boundary option uh, enabled, it will pull away from the boundary a little bit. Although in this case, it's going straight down so it doesn't really matter. Um, but if I grab the tweak brush, I can just pull that closer and it locks right to the boundary. Do the same thing on the back just in case. And then switch back to relax. And you notice we also have hotkeys for switching between them. So right now it's actually mm -hmm. set up with Q, W, E, R, T to switch between tools. Nice. And so you can switch really quickly and just works. Um, so a couple of questions for yes. you. Um, sorry, I, I assume Come you would have gotten to this, but um, we, uh, is, it, is it free to try? And then also, is there a release date set? Yeah, uh, well, I'll go backwards. So first on the release date, um, there is not a release date set. Um, I don't like release dates because we always miss them. <laughs> uh, I hear that. But, but we, are, we are aiming for the next, next month or two. Um, and basically what will happen is we will do a, um, it will be a free update to all existing customers on um, via the Blender Market. So if you've previously purchased it, you will, you will get a free copy. Um, mm -hmm. As far as being free to try, technically, yes. Uh, so Retopaflow is all GPL, it is open source. Um, and in fact, the whole thing is available on GitHub for free. Uh, if you're familiar with GitHub, you can download it. Uh, you can try 2.0 as of today. And there's many reasons for that. Um, the, the, the most required one is simply that being a Blender add-on, it has to be GPL compliant because we use the Blender um, Python API extensively. And so it has to be, the code actually has to be open source. Um, and in that spirit, you know, one of the things that we've wanted to do, even though we sell the tool, is we want, we want to encourage other people to, to get involved. You know, if they want to, uh, if they want to use the code for one of their own, uh, own add-ons, you know, if somebody wants to add additional tools to Retopoflow and sell that as an existing add-on, as a free add-on, by all means, they're totally game to do that. And so we, we keep this, the source code completely open and accessible, um, but also it makes for much easier bug tracking. You know, when somebody, somebody finds a bug, they can report it. And then uh, by having it, having it open, they can, they can follow the development updates and we can just tell them outright, say, hey man, your, your bug's been fixed, go ahead and you know, get the new version. And so it just, it removes a lot of the barriers. Um, that does mean that it is free to try. So, you know, while we don't, we don't, we don't give out a free demo, but it's there if you want to go for it, right. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, should I go find the GitHub link? Go for it. And post that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, for anybody that's wondering, basically the way that we, the way that we view it is we're not selling software. We're selling services and we're selling the support and the commitment to say, hey, we are going to continue working on this and making sure that it's compatible with future versions of Blender, that it you know, is as bug-free as we can make it, that we'll actually be working on the bugs. And so you know, that's, that's what it is to us. So we don't really care about sharing the source code uh, in the sense that like, just because you have the code doesn't, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to pay for the code. You're not really paying for the code. You're paying for the support that comes with that and the guarantee that we will continue working on it. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is where it starts getting, you know, super fun. And one of the, I think I saw a question come through earlier about, um, Patrick's edge patches. Um, so Patrick, yeah. for anybody that doesn't know, Patrick Moore was the original developer. Um, I, I started working with Patrick, 
uh, in 2003. Wow, yeah, four years ago, um, when we basically came up with the original goal of contours. Because originally the, the tool was just contours. Um, and so Patrick and I started working together. He built the first version. Uh, and then we started going from there with realizing, hey, there's a lot more than just contours in this tool set that we need. Uh, and so then, then came polystrips, and then actually polystrips and contours got merged into a single tool, uh, and we went from there. Um, and so uh, over the last couple of years, Patrick has been working on um, a thing called edge patches, which basically, um, I, don't, see, I don't have a great way to demonstrate it live, but I'll kind of do it with polystrip. So like, imagine that you have, say, you draw out a line like this, and then you draw another line here, and you select both of them and hit F. It should just fill that, basically fill that with a grid fill. But it should do the same thing if you, say, have something like this, where you then have basically a five-sided uh, square, a five-sided patch. You ought to be able to fill that and have it automatically calculate where the poles should go, have the ability to move the poles, um, and all that kind of functionality for basically filling large areas in one go. And he had all the code working. Um, and the, I guess the somewhat unfortunate part is that basically as it was getting close to being ready for integration uh, is when we decided to work on 2.0. And <laughs> at that point, you know, our, our code base was, oh, I don't know, two and a half, three years old. And for anybody that does development, you'll know that, um, regardless of anybody's ability, um, older code bases invariably always need refactored. Like you, you just start getting a lot of spaghetti code and it starts getting messier. And so, you know, we took the chance with 2.0 to say, hey, let's, let's start everything fresh. Um, and so patches is just something that we haven't looked at yet, though we absolutely want to bring it back. So like, for example, like you ought to be able to say, select this area, this area, like let's say if I select all of these edges using polypen. Whoops. Um, there we go. Like if I select this area, you ought to be able to draw out a line here and draw out a line here and let those be your guides and then have that auto filled with a grid fill. Um, and we know how to do it. It's just, well, I don't know how to do it. I know how it, how the artist side would work. <laughs> uh, uh, and yeah, so we, so that would be quick, but it's, it'll be a little while before that's ready. Right. So we have a question about sources and um, uh, John wanted me to, to, for you to mention that, uh, let's see, any visible mesh is a source oh, now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's actually a really good question. I'm going to jump back to the skull. So to demonstrate this, actually, let me show you how, how this works in 1.x. So basically, for anybody that's not aware, the way that Retopoflow has always worked in the past is we have what's called a source and a target. The source object is your high resolution model that you are retopologizing. And then your target is the object that then you are pushing geometry to. It's, it's gonna be your low resolution clean mesh. Um, and so you are always limited to one source and one target. So in the case of this skull here, I have one, two, three, four, like four different sources. And so in the 1.x version of Retopoflow, the version that's publicly available right now, that if you were to buy it, that's what you would get. Um, you always had to, you had to specify a source. And so you would go in here, you would choose the one that you want, um, or you could use the eyedropper. Or if you didn't choose one and you just say activated polystrips, it would automatically set the source for you based on whatever the active object was. was. Um, uh, and that worked pretty well. But like in this case, if you have multiple sources, it meant that you could only retopologize one object at a time which for something like this isn't that big of a deal, you know, because, you know, they're pretty distinct individual objects. Um, but if you have like a, a technique that a lot of people will use for, for like character sculpts is you might have your head as one sculpt and the body as another within basically a seam, just a, a seamless seam between the two. So like if we were to grab say this model, you know, you might have the head sculpted here with a really high density mesh, and then the body would be sitting, you know, just adjacent to it, such that it looks like a continuous surface, but it's not actually. And in the case of 
um, 1.x, you, you would have to do those separately. And so you would have to kind of like artificially create a polygon line between the two and then merge them later. Well, in two, that's no longer the case. The way that two works is all, all objects that are visible in the current scene are your source. So in this case, if you wanted to start a new retopology um, session, you would first see all of your objects, which are then tied under the empty here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five objects. You just deselect them. You hit any one of the retopology tools. And all it does from the menu here, since we start our own mode, is just determines which tool is active when we start. So in this case, say I go to Polystrips, it will load it up. <coughs> and it'll take a little bit, but you'll notice here in the outliner, it has now created a different object for us. And we can now go across as many objects as we want. Um, now, in this case, this, that's not necessarily a recommended way to draw a strip because obviously we've got lots of seams between them and little you know, nooks and crannies that are grabbing the edges, but it works. Um, and so just like you can, you know, if you're using, say, face snapping in, in Blender, you can now snap across multiple objects, which makes things like this much, much easier. Because in, uh, in 1.x, you would have to do this as separate pieces or you would have to join those sculpts together. Um, particularly with details like this, it's really, really nice because, you know, this is a detail that, like, if this were a game model, you wouldn't model that geometry in. No, this would just be a smooth, you know, smooth area, you know, something like, like this, and you would just create a normal map across that to then get all your detail, you know, because all you care about is the silhouette, and if you rotate around here, you'll notice that aside from very, very minute details, that inset disk doesn't ever contribute to the silhouette. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered the question. So now all, mm -hmm. all objects in the scene contribute to the source. Uh, if you don't want an object to contribute to the source, then you simply hide it and then go back into Polyships or any tool. Doo, 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 doo. And then it won't work. Well, we'll, we'll catch those errors because that shouldn't actually happen. But point is hidden objects do not count. That's pretty great. Yeah. Wow. Um, let's see. Uh, I had a, some questions, two questions yes. um, from a user. Can you add edge loops with something like loop cut? And also, will there, will, what, how will this coincide with the 2.8 Blender release? So first of all, um, the, for 2.8, um, it won't really coincide in that this will be out long before 2.8 is out. Um, and aside from some, some OpenGL code under the surface, 2.8 should not affect this basically at all. Um, maybe the exception is we might, you know, ship like a custom template or something for mm. Blender since 2.8 is going to include a lot of new, new like UI template options so far as workspaces and such. Like we might ship, say, like a retopology workspace that we just think is kind of optimized for that. But mm -hmm. beyond that, it should have for the user side, should have zero impact. You know, we'll likely have to do some code updates under the surface, but you mm -hmm. won't notice. Um, and as far as adding in loop cuts and things like that, yes, but not yet. Um, so I can show you how it will work um, because actually we, we have loop cuts added in um, 1.3, but we have not yet re-added it in 2.0. Because basically with 2.0, since we were building it from the ground up, um, basically like we already, we knew what we wanted and what we had, um, but we, we're now re-adding each feature as we go on. By the way, what, what just happened there is since I had, you notice that like I activated re Retoboflow and the face of the skull disappeared. The reason being is you notice it's active right now. And so Retoboflow actually thinks that that is going to be my, my retopology object. And so we just need to deselect it to make sure that it gets added to the source. Um, we're still figuring out the best way to communicate that to the user. Because one nice thing about 1.x is this is pretty pretty clear in the sense of like using the, the target and source is is clear in that it makes the workflow simple. Um, mm -hmm. The 2.0 workflow is better, but there's some, you know, we're not able to communicate that as clearly to the user yet. So we're still figuring out how to best handle that. But in this case, like if I reactivate this, so let's say I go in here. Um, I'm going to add in some, some strips, 
um, and then like I want to I want to add loop cuts to these later. So you know maybe I'll just do something like this, and there we go. Hit enter. I'd go into edit mode, um, and so in 1.x we have the loop cut and loop slide tools. So if I do loop cut, oops. See I got to specify a source object. See that's actually really annoying. Uh, <laughs> do a loop cut. And then we can go in and we can cut that geometry just like we would with Blender's regular loop cut, except that it snaps everything to the to the uh, to the surface, which is a little hard to see on a model like this. Well, actually, you'll be able to see it like right here. You'll be able to see it snap. Uh, let me just zoom in a little more, so you can kind of see that snap to the surface as I put it in. Um, maybe even more so if I. Sometimes because the geometry is under the surface, like the, the old de detections for what what is getting cut don't work the best. Um, luckily, that's getting getting improved. There you go. There you can see it snap to the surface. Um, so what we're going to do is in 2.0 is we'll do a very similar thing uh, where just like we have all of our other tools active here, so contours, polyspheres, polypen, we'll have the loop cut tool such that you can go in and just add new cuts, remove cuts at any time. Um, and that, that includes the ability to add cuts, delete cuts, slide loops, um, potentially bevel loops. You know, basically we can, now that we've got a solid foundation, we're able to start building in a lot more tools that previously were a lot more difficult to do. Um, cause basically in, in, in the past, to make a long story short, like we were basically recreating the, the UI and workflow for every single tool that we added. Um, whereas now we can basically just inherit a lot of stuff from the, the base retopology mode uh, mm -hmm. and then just go from there. So adding adding new tools is much, much simpler now. Um, so question for you, yeah. you started to hit on it. Um, oh, and I just lost my train of thought, but it was, oh gosh, let me go back and find it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, oh, you were just talking about it. Um, well, sorry. Okay, well, I'll remember that. Um, Ivan, the the modeler of the the head, is here. He he hey, has Ivan. a question. That's that John answered. But um, hello, thank you for the model. Yeah, it is. Ivan, this this model is awesome. Um, it makes both a great demo model and a hard demo model because there's so much more pressure to make this look good because <laughs> the model's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Uh, it's also, um, just for anybody that's curious, this, this has made such a good test model for us in development. Cause like we've been testing with this model for a while because there's so many areas on here where this model is solid in that, uh, like literally solid in that there's thickness to it. And probably the single biggest issue that we have had throughout all of our TopoFlow's development. So if you ever decide that you want to, um, you know, work with surface snapping and things like that in an add-on, whether that's for reach topology or not. Just know that thin surfaces will be the absolute worst enemy of your life um, because <laughs> they are such a pain. Because basically what we're doing, um, and John, please, by all means, correct me. And uh, if I say anything ridiculous, that is completely off base. And when I say John, I'm talking about Jonathan Denning, who's here in the chat. He's the main developer. Um, uh, but basically, we're ray casting from the view every time that you know you perform an action. And so... What, what tends to happen is sometimes like we're, when we go from opposite directions to try and find the backside such that like here, you notice as I rotate around, we view the geometry differently because we know that it's on the backside of the surface. Sometimes detecting that backside of the surface is a little harder because depending on the scale of the model, the, the, the ray may not find the correct point or may not find the correct point from your perspective as far as the computer is concerned is the right one. Uh, and so it just gets really, really challenging to get all of that correct. And so this has been one of the best test models that we can possibly do for the sake of stress testing. Uh, to give you an example of the types of issues that we tend to run into is if we do a strip like this and watch, it probably won't happen now that I'm trying to demo, uh, I, I'm trying to intentionally break it, is <laughs> as I increase segments here or decrease segments on the strips, every now and then it'll, oh, there, there it happened. So you can see here, um, half of my geometry disappeared and that's because it's now sitting on the opposite side and oh wow that it's and one of the problems with it is now that it's on the opposite side i can no longer grab it because well i can grab it with the the beziers but like if i switch to the tweak brush 
some of that geometry is not able to be modified and some of it is. So it's, yeah, thin surfaces are a pain. <laughs> well, but you recovered it there. Like it wasn't. I didn't yeah, have to which is maybe a over. first because I didn't actually expect that to work. Okay. Um, so cool. I'm glad that it worked, but yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Sorry actually, for the brain fart. Um, oh yeah. Go I ahead. know, uh, Ivan. When we were chatting earlier, you had a question that I said I would answer, so I'll answer it now. Um, uh, Ivan had asked me earlier on whether or not we would support subdivide. So to give you an example, let's say I have, um, let's say I add a cube and I'm just gonna move it over just to demonstrate. So imagine for a second that this cube is now sitting directly on top of the skull and I go into edit mode and I hit subdivide smooth. Every time I subdivide, it should just snap to the cube such that let's say if it's like, if it's like this, like actually over the skull, hitting subdivide should each time just basically snap it to the surface such that you can basically use a lot of Blender's default tools to whether it's increasing your mesh density to smoothing something, it should just basically work effectively like, like shrink wrap, but mm -hmm. with more power. Um, and the answer is we don't have it yet, but we, we want to. Um, so yeah, cause that would, that would make doing a lot of things like, you know, quickly, like creating that that overall um, ball shape for the for the cranium out of a out of a subdivided cube is really really quick. And so, if we could create the cube, sub subdivide it smooth, and then just snap it to the surface without ever having to worry about shrink wrap modifiers or whatever, suddenly that that takes away again to talk about automating the simple stuff. That takes away you know thirty minutes of work in like two steps, and then you can again focus on the complicated areas for what you really need to get done. Right. Sorry for the brain fart earlier, but the question was, is it possible to start using Retopo Flow on an existing mesh? Yes. Okay. Um, so the, uh, you'll notice like, so right now I have an exist, so this is for all intents and purposes, existing geometry. Like, yes, I created it with Retopo Flow, but the moment that you leave um, Retopo Flow mode, it's just like any other mesh. So for example, Let's say I want to go the traditional route and I activate face snapping, snapping to other objects and I go into vertex mode and then I just start oops, extruding this out like this and like this. So I'm going the, the traditional route. Everything is snapped to the surface because I enabled face snapping um, and then I activate poly strips. All of, oops, it helps if I have the right object selected. Yeah. Do, do, do. All of that geometry is there. Um, Perfect. So yeah, you can you can absolutely start with an existing model. You can you can use Retobaflow in conjunction with Blender's regular tools. You can use it in conjunction with Maya, Moto, you know, whatever your tools are. You can absolutely just combine it. You know, our goal is we want to be able to offer the complete retopology pipeline for basically the vast majority of all needs. Um, so, you know, we're going to continue adding more and more tools, but if you have a tool set that you really, really like, or say if there's a tool that we don't yet offer, such as loop cut um, or the, you know, subdivide smooth, then by all means combine it with whatever tools you wish, because it'll work. As that's incredible. So a couple more questions for you. Yep. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, John just answered it. But the question was, if Retopo Flow is bought now, do they get 1.x or 2.0? Uh, if you buy it now, you will get 1.x, um, but then you'll get a free upgrade to 2.0 when it becomes available. All right. And then, so we did have a question about F2, I think, yeah. um, basically like, that functionality that F2 brings, is there any plans to include that functionality into, um, you know, face creation? Yeah, in some way or another, um, it'll probably get added into Polypen. Um, we're still figuring out how we want to do it. You know, there's a couple of key features that Polypen is currently missing, some of which are um, in 1.x. Um, so the, the first main feature is the ability to cut new geometry. So for example, if I have this edge selected, um, I want to be able to cut into, oops, 
Well, I just made a mistake by using Blender's regular undo feature. <laughs> uh, nobody's ever lost geometry from that. <laughs> um, so, like, if I wanted to, say, select this edge and I wanted to just cut a point in right here, um, mm -hmm. that, that hasn't been re-added yet. It's in 1.x, but we're going we're gonna to bring it back because um, it's awesome. Basically, it's, it's acts, like, acts exactly like Blender's knife tool, um, okay. but combined with the regular polypen tool. Um, and so then cool. for F2 functionality, like for example, like if I select this edge to be able to just hit F, F, F to fill this, um, probably, uh, it's, it's not a priority yet only because, you know, we're, we're putting the priority on basically the, the surface geometry tools on, uh, in, in other words, the tools to create the geometry immediately to the surface. And so like polypen right now already allows you to fill this area pretty quickly, not as quick as F2 but a heck of a lot quicker than traditional tools. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're looking at, it makes the workflow a little tricky just as far as offering too many options. But like if we go, let me undo that. So let's say we're in this area. Right now, polypin works in all triangles, but then it smartly combines triangles into quads like so. Mm -hmm. um, and basically it works that if you have a triangle selected like this and you add a new, new vertex, it automatically turns it into a quad. If you wanted to keep this triangle, you would simply select the edge and then insert it, and then it won't combine the two. Um, and so one of the things that we want to do here is you ought to be able to just have basically a, an edge extrusion mode, where like right now, you'll notice with the preview, it, I'm just extruding a vertex. Well, it'd be kind of nice if, say, like if I hold down Control-Shift, maybe I want that to extrude an edge and to be able to detect the two adjacent ones such that you could just click, click, click and have that autofill faces. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that could work. It could be just F2 where you just like the edge, you hit FFF and it fills that. You know, we, do, we just basically have to spend some time thinking about how do we want that to work? How do artists want it to work? Um, you know, what are the more viable options? You know, is it better just to say, hey, let's just, you know, expose F2 within the Retopo flow mode, you know, because that could mm -hmm. potentially be done. Um, right. There's a lot of different ways that we can go about it. Right. All right, a couple more questions for you if you're yeah. good to answer. Let's do it. Um, and then we can, so, we'll, we'll wrap up here in like the next 10 minutes. Um, so by all means, if you have questions, let's, ha let's hear them. Awesome. Some really good comments in there. One from Omar. This has been pretty mesmerizing, and I agree. I've been qu quieter than normal just because I'm kind of mesmerized myself. Um, but questions, any plans to make this standalone in the future? <laughs> uh, That'd be hard. We, we've talked about it a lot, actually. Um, uh, I'm not going to say that we have plans on it. Um, we, ha we have talked about it, and it's definitely something that we're intrigued by. You know, particularly, there's, there's a lot of people I know that use use existing tools that really don't like their existing tools for uh, retopology. And it would be pretty sweet to be able to offer them a more compelling option um, without forcing them to learn Blender. But then again, then a part of me is like, well, why not just, you know, just because Retopoflow works within Blender doesn't mean that you have to learn the rest of Blender, like just learn just enough to, to use Retopoflow perhaps. Um, so yeah, eh, hard to say. We, we've definitely mm -hmm. had those discussions and we're, we're, we're not taking it off the table, but there's no, you know, there's no active plans. Gotcha. Um, a few more, uh, they're kind of building up. Uh, so question one point X came with very comprehensible tutorial videos. Can I expect the same sort of videos for two as well? Yes. Um, it, my, my hope is to re basically redo the entire course for Retopo flow at the same time as 1. Point, or as 2.0 coming out. Cool. Perfect. Um, so another one. Uh, can we start a poly strip stroke from a, like starting from a triangle? Um, I think so. Um, let's find out. Let's say I've got a triangle here. And now I create a poly strip. Um, Hey, hello. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. That's pretty great. Um, another one. 
it's a it's a bit worry, but when you start a retopo and left the mode, the retopology becomes a regular mesh. But somehow in your demo, when you go back to the retopo tool, mm -hmm. it be once again becomes a retopology object. Basically, how does it remember that you can continue making retopo strikes? There are strokes. Um, uh, see that that's okay. Actually, um, that is what makes two point awesome specifically um, mm -hmm. because. Let me, let me try and answer this in a little bit of a longer question because this was basically at the heart of why we wanted to do 2.0, how we did it. So first to demonstrate kind of the core of the issue, let's say I use, um, using 1.x, here's the old poly strips. So this would create the, the geometry on the fly. Um, but one of the things is that it's completely dynamic. I don't, there is no geometry created yet from these two two strokes. Um, it is whoops, it is all fake, um, such that if I hit escape, no geometry is created. If Blender crashes, no geometry is created. If I make a mistake and hit escape too early, no geometry is created, because basically all we're doing is we're calculating the points, we're drawing the faces between those points, and it is not until you hit enter that we actually turn that into geometry. In 2.0, we, we create geometry natively in that if I draw this strip on, this is now real geometry. Um, if I hit escape, the geometry is there. If Blender crashes, the geometry is there. If I get an error, the geometry is there. We are creating the geometry on the fly always. Um, and initially, this was presented a big problem in 2.0 because it meant we lost a lot of that dynamic nature that made things like poly strips so compelling. You know, we lost the ability to, say, adjust the segment count um, to, you know, automatically fit the Bezier curve and things like that. But thanks to clever coding, we brought all that back. So, for example, this is real geometry, but at the end of the day, it's just faces with a Bezier curved fit to them. So why not have the ability to adjust that? This oh, of course it did that one. Um, let me let me get a better <laughs> example. Uh, let's say we we grab this. Even though this is real geometry, we can adjust these segments at any time because all it's doing is basically creating a strip of faces along that Bezier curve. Um, and so there is no retopo flow object or like special mode. I mean it's. The only thing that's really different in the case of the geometry specifically in this is that we are taking over the drawing. So we're doing the drawing differently than Blender draws it. This is still real geometry. We're not converting that geometry. We're not saving a database with all that geometry such that then we can reference it later. It's just actual geometry. Um, and so then the power in 2.0 comes not from the ability to, you know, visualize geometry in a cool way that then commits to actual geometry. Instead, the power comes from the ability to manipulate actual geometry in really, really interesting ways. Um, so like, and that's actually one of, the, one of the side effects of doing this is what enabled us to do things like, like this. So I select this strip. As I add a new, each time I add a face to the selection, it extends my Bezier curve. I have just one strip, whereas in 2.0, or sorry, in 1.x, you only had the strips that you created specifically, and they had then junction points at each endpoint or at each end that were the only things that you could actually manipulate. Here, if I want to manipulate just these faces via the Bezier curve, cool, I'd manipulate those ones. So where this starts to become really cool is let's say I draw this on like this, I get it close, I can then extend it, and I have two strips, I can connect that, I have a third strip, but at the end of the day, it's just a face of quads, and so we have one strip. Or, since, since we're working with Bezier curves, like getting it to fit this exact profile with only two handles can be a little cumbersome. So instead, just select the distance that you want, manipulate that <laughs> down, manipulate that down, and then you know what, let's go ahead and let's start here. Let's bring this one down a little bit, but then you know what, let's deselect. We don't need that face anymore. So now we can bring this back over. And so we're, we're literally working natively with the geometry, which enables a lot of really, really cool functionality. Wow. I, did that answer the question in a kind of a roundabout way? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you definitely did. Yeah. Wow. 
let me check back to see if we have any more. There were a couple more questions. Um, John is really helping answer. Oh, good. Yeah, big time. Um, I think there was a John, you're awesome. <laughs> Agreed. I mean, if this hasn't proved it. Um, no, I think he must have he answered them. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think you're clear. Cool. Well, um, yeah, thanks, everybody. I think I'll go ahead and wrap it up. I mean, we've got, we can, if you have a last-minute question, by all means, get it in. Um, you know, I will just say, um, number one, thank you to everybody that has supported the project so far. You know, I think to date we've sold just over 1,700 copies of Rotopa Flow, which is really pretty awesome. It's it's at this point one of the largest selling add-ons for Blender ever, I think, which is which is awesome and super humbling. Um, I'm really, really excited for you guys to all try 2.0 because 2.0 is, is in, in all sincerity, the tool that we always wanted Rotopa Flow to be. Um, you know, the 2.0's biggest limitation right now, honestly, is just the missing features that we're still bringing back. But it's infinitely more stable, it's more usable, it does, it completely changes the workflow. So if you've been using 1.x a lot, uh, just expect differences. Hotkeys are different, workflow's different, functionality's different, but I truly believe that it is much, much for the better. Um, and there's a lot more coming. Uh, and like I said earlier, we're trying to, we're trying to get it released within the next um, couple of months. We're not, we don't have a set release date yet, uh, and we won't until it is truly uh, ready for release. And then the release date will be strictly for marketing purposes, because until then, we will likely miss it. Um, and yeah, if you if you already own a copy, you will be getting a free upgrade. If you want to try 2.0 now. Uh, send me a message via the inbox on your blendermarket.com account, and I'll be happy to give you a copy of 2.0 to try out, so long as you recognize that it's still early, early alpha. Um, and if you have never purchased a copy before, you want to purchase a copy, you're looking forward to 2.0, um, you can get it on the Blender Market. It's like blendermarket.com slash product slash Rotopaflow. Kent, maybe you could put a link in the chat if you haven't already. Um, or actually, you know what? There's yeah, a link sure. in the description below the stream. Um, and you can get it there. Um, just know that if you purchase it today, you will get a free upgrade to 2.0. We haven't decided yet, but when 2.0 comes out, we will likely increase the price a little bit because of the amount of work involved. Um, we will be sure to make that publicly known though and make an announcement so that we don't surprise anybody. Um, so don't worry about that for today because basically whenever it comes out, if we do decide to change the price, we'll give a, a window for, hey, you know, in two weeks it'll go up, so grab it. Um, but that hasn't been decided yet. And yeah, and if you run into any issues, um, there is a link in, once you have Rotopaflow installed in Blender, if you go to the user preferences, which I can't actually go to right now, or like it won't show up in the stream because I'm sharing just my window, not, not my entire display. Um, but if you go to the add-on page within Blender, there is a link to report a bug or issue. So if you run into issues, um, be that in 1.x or in 2.0, uh, there's a link to the GitHub page where you can log a bug report and we'll absolutely work on it. Just be sure that you mention which version you're working with. Um, and with that, uh, unless there's any last minute questions, thanks everybody. I do, have, oh, uh, yeah. I do have two more if you got time. Let's do it. All right, so first one, can we expect a numerical interface for procedural modeling? I don't quite understand that. Maybe uh, Kara Blender, if, if you could clarify uh, what you mean by that. Yeah, why don't we go, uh, move, let's move to the second question while that's getting clarified, because um, I don't have any idea what that means in the context of retopology. <laughs> right, so then the next one, um, would it help if for thin geometry if we scale up the model before entering retopo mode? Yes, with an exception. Um, transforms on models, it should be mostly solved, but historically, if you have a modified scale or rotation, historically that has caused lots of issues because it causes the, the matrices and I'm getting out of my depth, but basically <laughs> things go wrong. Uh, pretty sure it's solved in 2.0 such that it's just not an issue, but if you scale up the model in order to improve thin surfaces, yes, that will absolutely work. Be sure to apply the scale first. Um, same thing, if your model is super, super tiny, you can expect issues. And at the same time, if your model is super, super big, you can potentially expect issues. Um, for example, there's actually a bug, 
it's, well, it's not so much a bug, more just a consequence of the way that it works. Uh, in 1.x, if your model is really, really big, like say, you know, 20 meters tall, well, I mean, not that it's that big, but like, say your character is 20 meters tall or 100 meters tall uh, and the scale is applied, if your start and end clip distances on the view camera are too small, as soon as you enter um, specifically contours, but I think this applies to all the tools, your model seemingly just disappears because of the way that the clip and end starts are set. So if you have models randomly disappearing when you're activating stuff, you probably need to either play with the model scale or, and or, adjust the start and end distances within your viewport clipping, which is uh, this feature right here. That thing. Um, hmm. So like normally def default distances work really well. And basically in all of our testing, the way that we kind of define what's an acceptable standard is using default blender values. If a model fits within the grid, it should be completely supported. Um, so if your model is super, super tiny or super, super large and you're running into issues, try just scaling it to fit within the default grid and maybe go from there. So by the grid, I mean this grid. <laughs> nice. Um, we did get a little bit of clarification uh, from Kara Blender. She was asked, or he was asking um, if there were plans for a numerical input option, like for strip density, for example. Oh, uh, yeah. So some of that is already there. So for example, the contours tool, um, you notice here under the options bar, this is not complete by any means, but if you toggle down contours, you'll see a numerical input for count. And so that currently sets the the number of vertices on that contour. Um, it does not currently change the amount on the selected contour. Um, it might later, but what it does do is change the count upon creation. Um, and so we'll, for, for poly strips, we probably won't do that because for example, on poly strips, um, it's actually just based on your brush size. So you're, all we do is we create the strip with as square as faces as we can based on the radius of your brush. And so if your brush is super tiny, you will get lots of faces. If you, your brush is super large, you'll get fewer faces because then you can adjust the segment, segments after the fact to get a, a better fit. Um, and Excellent. initially, you know, we, we, can, we can constrain this further. Like we could allow you to set, you know, maximum or minimum segments or something like that potentially. Um, we figured this is the simplest and you know lowest barrier of entry as far as determining the segment count. For one, you know one of the things we would like to do in Rotopaflow is encourage good geometry, and at least when in doubt, good geometry means square faces. So, sweet. All right, I think that's cool. it. Cool. Well, thank you everybody. I appreciate it. And if you have any questions after the fact, by all means, get in, get in touch with me. Feel free to try it out, um, support the project, and thanks for watching. Cheers. All right.